the best in the world podcast with Richard Parr. Hello, everybody. I'm Richard Parr, and you are listening to the best in the world. Every single week, I have the absolute pleasure of talking to an Olympic champion or a world champion or a former world record holder or a world number one to find out what makes them the very best at what they do, what makes them the best in the world. We have had so many fantastic guests from on the show, from athletics, from rugby, from football, from cricket, from swimming, from rowing, from shooting, you name it, we've had them on the show and we learn every single week from them. This week we're learning from the Olympic volleyball champion Phil Dalhauser. The American won gold at the 2008 Beijing Olympics and we have a really good chat with Phil. We talk about a whole host of topics with Phil, talking about where beach volleyball originated, what it's like being in the White House and meeting the president how he had a blood clot just before the 2012 London Olympics and why he was getting booed at Rio in the summer at the 2016 Olympics. That and much, much more is coming up with my interview with Phil Dalhauser. You don't want to miss it on this week's Best in the World with Richard Parr. A couple of things we need to mention just before we get to the interview. If you haven't already, please like the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Sportachino. Sportachino is my brand new sports breakfast show. We're live on Facebook and live on YouTube every single weekday morning. Please check us out at 8am GMT. So please check that out. Of course, you can go back and watch them back if you can't watch them live. Plus also, if you'd like to support the show, you can do that by downloading a free audiobook by trialing out Audible. Audible is one of the leading suppliers of audiobooks in the world. It's really easy to get your free 30-day trial and one free audiobook download. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash best. That's audibletrial.com forward slash best to give their service a try. By doing that, you actually help me out because they are this week's sponsor of the show. We would love for you to help support our show. Our podcast are best in the world with Richard Parr Show. All right, let's get to my interview. Let's speak to the Olympic volleyball champion, Phil Dalhauser. The best in the world podcast with Richard Parr. Phil Dalhauser, welcome to the best in the world with Richard Parr, Olympic volleyball champion. You've had an absolutely amazing career, but obviously this is part of your life where it's post-Olympics and it's not all about the training. So what have you been up to since Rio? Uh, first of all, thanks for having, uh, having me on, uh, on the show. Uh, and uh, post-Rio, we, we had a couple of events that we had to play in and uh since then it's kind of just been um a little relaxing time with the family and uh i just got back in the gym a couple of weeks ago uh so a few hours of that a day and then just hang out with the kids how difficult were those first few sessions back in the gym uh you know he our uh our strength coach kind of eases us back into it so uh, it wasn't too bad. I was a little sore, but not, nothing too crazy. And did I see on your Facebook page you also spent some time at the White House? Yeah, we uh, all the Olympic athletes were invited to the uh, the White House, and uh, we got to meet the president and the first lady and, and um, the vice president as well. Do, do you enjoy all of this, or do you kind of just wish that you, you were back in that routine of training, or, or is it just a, a, a fun way to kind of unwind after all the preparations which go to an Olympics? Uh, it, it's definitely a cool thing to do, to, you know, to meet the president. Um, but if I had my choice, I'd just rather hang, uh, hang out with the family, be at home. I'm kind of a homebody, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to meet. Uh, President Obama. Mm-hmm. 
All right, well, let's start at the beginning for when you, you got into into volleyball. And I believe you were quite a late starter to the sport. Is that right? I was, yeah. I started when I was uh, around 17, 18. Um, and uh, I started playing indoor. But uh, uh, indoor coach uh, was a beach player, and uh, he always um, suggested to go down to the beach and play. I grew up in Daytona Beach, Florida, so you know I had the luxury of having a beach 10 minutes away and um, I always liked the beach game uh, better. Mm. What was it about the beach game that you preferred? You're just, you're just more involved. Uh, you know, you're touching the ball almost every play on the beach and, and indoor you could go you know, four, five, six plays without touching the ball. Mm. You become a bit of a spectator in that way. And uh, Yeah. And then, and then, and then you also went, went went to college, and you were still playing. How how were you? A how good were you at juggling everything, both playing and studying and everything like that? Uh, I was um, I wasn't that great of a student because uh, we had we had four sand volleyball courts uh, on campus, so I would uh, I would get as many games as I could out there. You know, I probably spent more time down on those courts than I did. Uh, in the classroom, to be honest with you. So, uh, at which point did you realize that you were seriously good, that you could take this to an Olympic level? I, it didn't really hit me that I could, you know, really make a career out of this, out of beach volleyball, uh, until in 2004, um, my partner and I took a third place finish in um, the AVP Hermosa Beach Open. And... Um, we beat, uh, it was right before the 2004 Olympics, and we beat both Olympic teams, American Olympic teams in that event. So then I, I, was, I realized, man, maybe something could come of this. And um, after that season, I ended up, uh, I, I moved out to California to pursue, uh, you know, beach volleyball full time. And, and uh, you know, it just happened to work out for me. Mm, and it worked out of the 2008 Olympic Games when you won gold, and that that was with Todd Rogers. How did you come about meeting Todd? Uh, I met Todd uh, by uh, well, just playing. We played each other a few times um, on the AVP tour, but uh, when I moved out to California, I moved to Santa Barbara, which is about um, an hour and a half north of uh, well two hours north of L.A., and um, uh, that's where Todd was living, and that's where he trained. So we would train against him and his partner uh, quite often, and uh, after that one season, the 2005 season, he asked me to play. For me, it was a no-brainer, but it was a little tough because uh, um, I was playing with my buddy since for like five years and we kind of came up through the ranks and, and stuff, so it was tough to kind of, um, you know, break ties with him, cut ties with him. Mm. How did that conversation go? I mean, you know, it's it's obviously not an easy conversation to have, but um, it's it's kind of like breaking up with a girlfriend, <laughs> to be honest with you. But uh, you know, you just tell him. I just told him, uh, Todd. Todd asked me to play and. I'm making a business decision, and I think that's you know the best decision for for me professionally. And he understood, and um, um, he took it pretty well. And what were the the really strong attributes that that Todd had, which effectively brought the best out of you? Well, Todd was con- uh, was known as his nickname is the Professor. <laughs> So uh, he was a student of the game, and I was kind of just more of an athlete back then rather than a beach volleyball player. So he kind of molded me into the player I am today, and he really, um, with and he was, um, I'd say he was a really good defense and one of the best defensive players in the world, and side out players, and, and we just uh, we meshed instantly. Mm. You mentioned being an athlete there. Um, I read that you played quite a bit of tennis growing up. Were there any transferable skills between the two sports? Yeah, tennis and, and uh, volleyball are very complementary. Uh, both sports complement each other. Uh, tennis 
the serve uh, is basically the same motion as a volleyball swing. And a lot of the footwork um, and the ground strokes in tennis are similar um, to setting and, and just kind of um, just moving along, around the court in beach volleyball. Mm. So let's go back to, to 2008, Beijing Olympics. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, did you, how did you prepare for all of it? Were, were you ready, do you think, when you arrived? Um, uh, was I ready? <laughs> That's a good question because we lost our first match in Beijing to the, the last seeded team in, in the tournament. Uh, you know, uh, the few months before uh, Beijing, we Todd and I were on a roll. We we were winning everything. Uh, we'd won three straight Grand Slams in a row uh, before the Olympics, and um, we were just on a roll. And um, we had a little bit of a break, and it kind of I think it kind of killed our momentum. And um, uh, our first match was the day after the opening ceremony. And I st- st- the opening ceremony is, is a long day for the athletes. It's, you're basically on your feet for like eight hours. And I stayed the whole time. And, you know, I was like, I'm going to soak this whole thing up. And, uh, and so I didn't get back to our, um, our room till like 2 o'clock in the morning. And the next day my legs were just, they're dead. They're just from being on my feet all day day and um yeah we played that night and i was just awful we ended we lost uh but um we bounced back and we ended up winning our all of our matches you know the next seven matches or whatever it was and ended up you know winning gold i'm guessing you didn't go to too many opening ceremonies after that uh you know i i did uh, I've gone to all of them oh, since, wow. uh, since then, but um, uh, uh, we played uh, not the day after, but the, uh, two days after the ceremony. So I had a day to recover, basically. Oh, okay, yeah, a bit more sensible that time around. So tell us about right. the day when you won gold. How, how was that experience? Did you do anything differently on that day than you would for any other match? And what were your feelings when you got that winning point? Uh, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't do much, anything different really. Um, I was, I just remember being real excited, like I'm going to end the day. I'm going to walk away from this match with, uh, you know, Olympic medal, gold or silver, obviously. And, um, you know, I, I was obviously pretty happy about that. And, um, I think because of that, I played a little freely, like it, um, I wasn't that nervous, you know, I was just more excited uh to get out in the court and um and i think um my play showed you know i had a pretty good match and um you know winning that last point um if i had to describe it it was you know think of your the best feeling ever and multiply it by a thousand you know it's uh it's really indescribable that that feeling Mm. did it take long to sink in uh yes it did it did uh uh it probably took uh, a few weeks or so to really sink in and um and re- really still hasn't sunk in actually it's um it's kind of surreal still eight years later <laughs> wow yeah absolutely amazing so you said you didn't change much leading up to that final what was your typical match routine uh, it's basically the same thing really to this day, just, you know, warm up my same warm up, uh, kind of gets me really already physically and mentally just kind of going through, you know, the, the same like little, um, like I run around a little bit and, um, you know, do some lunges and re- kind of trying to get a good sweat going, a little light stretch and my shoulder warm warm up uh, to get you know get that ready and um and that's it then we start hitting and and passing a little bit and and uh, i'm ready to go are you superstitious at all if, if anything's not in the right place or you, you're not wearing the right clothes or anything like that does that affect you at all i used to not so much anymore but i used to wear the same pair of glasses 
until uh, we lost, and then I would switch it there, mm. and I wouldn't wear those pair. And luckily, I had uh, a great sponsor with Oakley who I had you know plenty. I was able to do that. I could just give those pair of gl- uh, glasses away and then uh, bust out a new pair. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. Don't worry, we'll be back with Phil in just a moment, but I just want to remind you that today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is one of the leading suppliers of audiobooks in the world. They've got over 180,000 titles to choose from, and you can use it on your iPhone, your MP3 player, your Kindle, all different ways that you can digest sports knowledge and other knowledge, of course, from audiobooks. If you would like to trial their service, it's very, very easy. You can get a 30-day trial and one free audiobook download. Very, very simple. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash best. That's audibletrial.com forward slash best. It's a service I personally use, so I highly recommend you go out and try it. Please go and give it a go. It's really easy. audibletrial.com forward slash best. All right, let's return to my interview with Phil Dalhousie. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. So four years later, you tried again to win Olympic gold at London, but uh, yeah. I saw that you, you had a bit of a, a health problem just leading up to the Games. What, what exactly uh, was involved there and how much did that affect your performance at the Games, do you think? Yeah, uh, two months before I had, um, I, uh, they found, doctors found two blood clots in my left shoulder and I was in the hospital for about, I don't know, four or five days and I couldn't, um, I couldn't really do much. I, I couldn't really train really that hard because I was on a blood thinner and, uh, doctors were afraid, like if I were to say, I don't know, run into the pole and get a concussion or something, uh. That I would, you know, you could ultimately die if you're on a, you know, a blood thinner. So, you know, two months before the Olympics, that you know, you're kind of, um, uh, you're kind of revving up a little bit, you know, for it, and um, it it hurt, hurt a lot. I mean, it hurt, um, killed our momentum, you know, killed our plan on on when to peak or whatever. It, it just threw everything off, and then, you know, month month later, I was thrown back on the world tour and then um like i just i wasn't in you know playing shape so i had to get in shape right away and and then my niece i have whatever most volleyball players do like um patella tendonite it's basically jumper's knee and that started flaring up and um it just wasn't um 2012 just wasn't meant to be it wasn't in the cards i guess Mm. And then 2016, you, you, you changed partners. And what was the atmosphere like? Because I read in one of your first matches that you were getting booed. Yeah, um, the U.S. and Brazil have uh, a um, beach volleyball, well, volleyball in general rivalry. Um, going back, you know, to when volleyball started, basically. Um, they say, actually, they say they invented beach volleyball in, in Rio, you know, in Copacabana. And uh, we say that it was invented in, in Santa Monica. Uh, so, um, you know, it goes back to really the beginning of beach volleyball. And so they just, you know, Brazilian fans, you know, they're a little louder and um, they like to, to like, they like to boo us. We've played in Brazil, you know, plenty of times. It's, it's nothing new for us. And, and honestly, I kind of like it. It's, um, it's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I bet it gives you that kind of extra incentive to, uh, to prove them wrong. Where where do Absolutely. you think the game started, America or Brazil? Uh, well, I believe that it started in Santa Monica <laughs> <laughs> in, in the US. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll appreciate you returning to Brazil even more next time, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how did you find that that whole experience back in August this year? Uh, it was actually uh, it was really it was really good. We I thought we played pretty well. 
uh, up to that quarterfinal match um, where we played the number one seed from Brazil. Um, unfortunately, they lost a, a match in their in pool, so um, they came out second of their pool and. And after pool play, it's a draw, and we drew them in, in the quarterfinals. Unfortunately, um, we we were, we were the three seed, so you know one and three playing in the quarterfinals is kind of early. Usually, that matchup is in in the semis or, or the finals. <clears throat> but um, yeah, like we we uh, it was really windy with that match, and, and that's you know that's a huge condition. Um, and they just dealt with the win better than we did, and we ended up losing in, in three sets. Mm. And they went on to win um, uh, the gold medal. Uh, yeah, so uh, losing to the, the best team there. So uh, I guess yeah. that's that's just the one thing to think about. So let, let's talk more about everything you, you do to to get ready for, for these games and become the, the prime athlete that you are. Um, how okay. how many times are you eating today, and, and and what type of food are you putting into your body? I'm not that crazy with my um, with my diet. I definitely eat cleaner, more uh, cleaner than I ever have in my life. Just because I'm 36 now, and and um, you know weight is a little tougher to come off these days. Um, so, like for example, this morning I ate uh, muesli with some uh, hemp seeds and and chia seeds, and uh, some berries like um, blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries, and, and a banana uh, with some almond milk, and uh, and then I took a protein shake with it and my cup of coffee, and um, you know whenever I'm, I'm done with uh, with the show here, uh, I'll head over to the gym, and uh, during the workout, I'll eat uh, like a protein bar, and, and then finish after the workout, I'll have um, a shake, a protein shake again, and then probably like a sandwich and a salad for lunch, and then um, I don't know for dinner maybe like uh, um, well last night we had pork chops and Brussels sprouts and and some brown rice. So uh, it's it's we're I'm eating pretty clean these days, um, mm. but like I said, it on because I'm I'm 36 and. Um, and I need to eat a little better to, um, to you know, because um, I end up I put on some bad weight a little easier these days, and um, and I wanna I wanna give myself the most uh, as many advantages as I can on the court. Mm, of course. And what is the one food vice that you have if you're not eating clean if you're gonna kind of splurge what what's the one food that that could sway you from that <laughs> i uh i have a sugar i have a, a sweet tooth uh and you know halloween was just um last week so there's a bunch of candy around the house so i'll sneak a a snicker snickers bar or like uh, some kind of gummy candy during <laughs> the day here and there take it from the kids uh um stash candy stash <laughs> did, did you dress up i did i uh i have a go-to uh outfit every year it's a inflatable sumo uh costume which um <laughs> it's kind of too small for me so my skinny legs stick out of the you know out of the suit and my my arms so it's it's kind of looks kind of silly <laughs> you mentioned family there and obviously being in a sport such as volleyball and the world tours and everything like that you're traveling the whole world how difficult yeah. is it being away from your family when you have to compete uh it's it's obviously not easy and, and it gets harder every single time i leave um but there, there's pros and cons of everything you know right now i'm not traveling so i get to i'm home all um you know i'm home most part of the day you know i just probably gone three hours for for the gym and then the rest of the time i'm i'm at home with the kids so i kind of make up in the off season for the time i'm i'm, I'm gone okay yeah that, that that makes sense well phil we, we've nearly run out of time on on the show but what i want to know is obviously you're 36 now you've been at, at three olympics uh it sounds like you're, you're back in the gym so are we expecting to see you compete at the 2020 games 
Um, that's uh, I'm not so sure. I'll be 40 then, and that's I'm not, I don't know if I can do another four years. I'm definitely playing next year. Um, but you know, if my sponsors keep resigning me, it will be hard to say no uh, to that and, and to the, the to the sport really. And um, I just may end up in uh, 2020 going after um, Tokyo. So um, I can't give you a for sure answer, but I would say it's about. I don't know, fifty-fifty at this point. Okay, well, if you do, we wish you all the best of luck. We wish you all the best for next year, Phil. Thanks. Just before you go, could you just tell us how we can continue to follow your journey on social media, please? Sure, I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Everything's Phil Dahl at Phil Dahlhauser. So uh, check check me out. Well, Phil Dahlhauser, thank you so much for being on this week's episode, and thank you for being the best in the world. Ah, great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. Thanks again to Phil for his extraordinary insight to the Olympic volleyball gold medalist on this week's Best in the World with Richard Parr. But Phil isn't the first volleyball champion we've had on the show. You may remember episode 25. That was with the Australian Kerry Potas. She is a former Olympic gold medalist. That's a really good interview. Check that out. Episode 25 on The Best in the World. You know, we're up to 39 episodes now. 39 different Olympic champions, world champions, world record holders, and world number ones. They've all been on The Best in the World with Rich Bar. And we've got many, many more for you to come. Next week, we've got the athletics superstar, Veronica Campbell-Brown, a three-time Olympic gold medalist. 200 meters Olympic champion. Incredible chat with her. I'll bring you all the details on that across my Twitter, and that's at Richard underscore Parr. We'll have details on our Facebook page. That's Best in the World with Richard Parr. And also we'll have details on richardparr.net. Check all of that out. And I'd love to get your thoughts on our shows. And I'd love for you to give me your thoughts on our shows via Twitter, via Facebook, via the website. Let me know what you like. Let me know what you don't like. Let me know some of the guests you'd like to hear from. And some of the questions you'd like me to ask some of these top, top stars. And in fact, very often on Twitter, I will ask for you to give me your questions for a guest I have lined up. So check my Twitter page out, at Richard underscore par. And you know what, if you want to help support the show, please go and download the free audiobook with Audible, but also please give us a rating and review on iTunes. That really, really helps grow our show. I would love it if you could do that for me. All right, so that's it for this week's episode. Look forward to next week's with Veronica Campbell-Brown. I've been Richard Parr, and you've been listening to the best in the world the best in the world podcast with richard parr